Welcome to episode eight of our series on the Good Shepherd. And over these last seven weeks now, we have been talking about Psalm 23, what is perhaps one of the most loved and most well-known of all of the Psalms, one of really the most well-known passages in all of Scripture. And we have been looking at this from the, from the perspective of David, who was one of the kings of ancient Israel, but before he became king, he was a shepherd. And so when he writes this psalm, as he starts off this psalm saying, the Lord is my shepherd, he is not writing this simply from this theo theoretical or even poetical understanding of a shepherd. He is writing it from the perspective of a shepherd, of someone who was out there in the fields, in the mountains, in the desert, leading and caring for a flock of sheep. And so we've been looking and taking a deep dive into every single one of these uh, verses here in Psalm 23. And today, or last week, we looked at this passage in the fifth verse, where David writes, You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. And we talked about how David has been talking about this whole, in this whole psalm, about a shepherd, and he's talking about it within the shepherding context, and how with this passage, he makes a little bit of a shift. Again, not a complete departure from the shepherding concept, but from a different aspect, where he's now talking about a shepherd who is welcoming people into his tent, and what exactly that meant for a shepherd in that time, and for someone today to invite somebody into their tent, into their house to be in the tent of God and to be in a tent of a generous host. And we looked at that yesterday. If you missed, or last week, listen, if you missed last week's episode or any of the previous episodes of this series, you can find them all online. Just go to our website at wearegracepoint.com, click the link that says a podcast, and all of our previous messages are there. Some of you have been asking me about that uh, because you've just found God's word in, in this in this very, very well-known text, so much deeper when understanding it from and looking at, it, looking at it from David's perspective. And so we have been kind of highlighting David's understanding and exploring the different ways that David would have understood the shepherding context. And so when we come now to verse 6, the final verse of this very, very short but very, very powerful psalm that David wrote, he goes back again into this shepherding context, and, and I want to tell you why this is important. Why is this is important to you and to me today? A recent Gallup poll found that over 60% of us, 60% are plagued by daily stress and worry. That's three out of five of us are dealing with daily stress and worry. This is up 14 points for stress and 21 points for worry just from a few years ago. That's 53 million more adults in the United States alone that are severely dealing with worry and stress. By comparison, in 2008, during the 2008 recession, it was only a two-point increase for stress and a five-point increase for worry. And listen, you and I, we have got a lot to worry about today. We're in the middle of uh, a recession. We are dealing with inflation. It seems like never-ending COVID is never-ending. There's a war in Ukraine, which is turning out to be a proxy war with Russia. Gas prices are through the roof. The, our political divide seems even greater than it's ever been. And now there is a new super spider that has come onto our shores. I was reading about this the other day. It's three inches long. And it can weave a web, get this, it can weave its web into a parachute. And with that, it can fly through the air up to 100 miles. I texted this to my daughter and she answered me back simply, done with this planet. And I understood completely that sentiment. Stress and worry and all of the things we're dealing with is a problem and it's growing. And we get this feeling that something bad is happening. And, and we don't know what it is because we can't see it. And usually we can see the things, but we can only see the things that are directly in front of us and that are not covered. But where are the things that we can't see? 
aren't the things that we can't see, the things that scare us, are usually the things that are coming up from behind us, the ones that are out of our field of vision. And I believe it's within this, with this understanding, with this same kind of feeling that David experienced when he was out in the wilderness being chased by the king who wanted to kill him. When he was the king and he was being chased by his enemies who wanted to kill him. When he was a a young boy and, and there was a giant who wanted to kill him. That he understood this feeling of intense stress and in this intense fear and this intense worry. And yet he saw what God did in his life. He saw how God took him through. And with that, he writes this. He says, surely goodness and love will follow me all the days of my life. And I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Now, as we close this out today, I simply want us to look at the first part. Surely goodness and love will follow me all the days of my life. Isn't that a beautiful sentiment? It's one of those really feel-good, loving, nice, brings-me-peace kind of statements. The problem I've seen is that it brings more peace to the person who's saying it and less peace to the person who's receiving it. So what is David really saying here? Well, for the shepherd, at the end of the day, what he does is he takes his sheep into a sheepfold. We've got a picture of it here, and We've seen this sheepfold before. We talked about this a few weeks ago. And what the shepherd does is as he's walking back to the sheepfold, you have to understand that the shepherd is now really, really tired. I mean, he has followed his sheep all day long. And remember that a shepherd and his flock typically typically will cover an area of about five square miles. And so at the end of the day, as it's getting late, when the sun is coming down, and it's starting to get dark, one of the things that happens to the shepherd, the same thing that happens to you and me when we're in a place and it starts to get dark, we start to become hyper aware of everything that is around us. And, we, and the shepherd starts to wonder if there is anything or anyone following the flock. If you've ever walked down a dark alley and have had that feeling like something is behind you, you know, like your spider sense is tingling, and you don't know what it is, and you don't hear anything, you just get this feeling that there is something behind you. The shepherd feels that as well. And because the shepherd can feel that, and he knows he's tired, and he knows that his flock is also tired, the shepherd knows that this is the time when they are most susceptible to predators. This is the best time for a predator to find that tired sheep or goat that is lagging behind the flock, that is, that is off by itself, that's having trouble keeping up, to find the weakest one, the, the, the weariest one, and to take advantage. Wolves are the best at this. They love to do this at dusk. And David is talking about this, about something that is following them. Something that is following the shepherd. But it's not a wolf. It's not a bear. It's not a lion. It's not a leopard. It's not a fox. He says, surely goodness and love will follow me all the days of my life. And it's not just at the end of the day, but he says all the days of my life. In fact, that word surely, if you look at the original Hebrew word, it actually is also translated only. Only goodness. And love will follow me all the days of my life. This is such an awesome picture. Because David knows from his own experience as a shepherd that he has to make sure to take care of the sheep that are at the back of the flock. You know, you see the sheep, the good thing about it is as the sheep are coming back towards the sheepfold, the sheep know where to go. And so at the end of the day, as the sheep are heading back toward the sheepfold, It's easy for the shepherd to start to lead the sheep towards the sheepfold and then slowly make his way to the back of the flock. Or sometimes, if the shepherd has a large flock, the shepherd will have under-shepherds who will lead the flock while the shepherd goes to the back. Sometimes the shepherd does this with dogs, that he will lead the flock and he will have sheep dogs, shepherd's dogs, following the flock. And the shepherd knows that you always have to be aware of something following you, especially in the dark. 
And this is instinctive for us. We get that feeling when we're going down a dark alley, when we're in a dark place, and it's important for us to, to become extra aware. It's important for the shepherd too. And David is saying that, yes, you're going to get that feeling, that something is behind you, that something is following you. But he says there's something that's really, really amazing. It's not a predator. It's not a wolf. It's not a bear. It's not something that is out to destroy you. He says goodness Now, that word goodness is the Hebrew word tov. And tov simply means good. It's the same word that is used in the description of the creation of the world, in the the account of the creation of the world in Genesis. In Genesis 1 and Genesis 2, God creates the world. And every time he creates something, he says, oh, that's good. He creates this, and oh, that's good. He creates that, and he says, oh, that's good. In Genesis 2, God creates Eve. And, and he says that it's not good, it's not Tov, that Adam was alone, and so he creates this helpmate for, for Adam, this woman. And there was a famous comedian years ago who would say, who, who had this joke, and I just never forget it, because he says, you know, do you, you know why God called woman, woman? And he said, well, because when Adam woke up the first time he saw Eve, he looked at her and said, whew, man, and that's how he got woman. And God said, it was good. It was tov. And then in the third chapter of Genesis, we read that the man and the woman, they do the one thing that God warned them not to do. And when they did that, the goodness, the tov, the shalom, the wholeness was shattered. And everything was that was as God intended it to be was just destroyed. And this is where sin and evil enter into the story of humanity and bring chaos and bring brokenness and heartache and pain and frustration. And this is just a short list of things that David experienced. And so when he writes that as I walk through the valley of deep darkness, I will fear no evil, he's using this contrast as he's painting this picture Right? And now he's talking about the difference between good and evil. Between tov and the, the word in Hebrew for evil is ra. It's the same language that is used in Genesis that describes the good of God's creation that David is using to describe the good that is following him. And maybe the reason that this contrast between good and evil, this contrast between Tov and Ra resonates with you and me today is because thousands of years later, you and I can still recognize that there is evil in the world. And that whether you are a follower of Jesus or not, that we all have a hope that the Tov, the good, will be restored in the world. That things will be made right that those sources of our heartache and our pain and our frustration will disappear. And David is saying that in the end, Ra will not win. He's saying it is Tov, it is goodness that is walking right behind you your entire life. He says only goodness and love will follow me all the days of my life. That good is following you, and it is following you all the days of your life. And as you experience God in your life, it becomes a reminder that God is always working, and that God is going to win in the end. We're reminded that God is always following us. And eventually, when we get to the end of days of life, the goodness of God will come through. It will prevail. Goodness will win. That is what David experienced. That is what David is writing about. That is the promise for you and me. And the thing is, is that when we look forward, because that's all we're able to do, when we look forward, we may not see it. But you will see it when you look back. You will see it when you have the opportunity to look back on your life and you can see that, yes, God was following you. Goodness. Tov was following you. And then you have this next word. He says, only goodness and love will follow me all the days of my life. That word love is the Hebrew word chesed. 
You know, there aren't many other words in Hebrew that are as significant as kesed. And yes, love is one translation, but it doesn't really capture it. Other translations say loving kindness, but that still kind of doesn't get the whole fullness of kesed. Chesed is a deep, abiding, faithful, covenantal love. Covenantal love. Scripture tells us that thousands of years ago, God makes a covenant with a man named Abram. We find this account in the Old Testament book of Genesis in chapter 12. And God says that I am going to bless the whole world through you, Abram. And we read through, when you read the story of Scripture, what we see is that Jesus was the fruition of that promise. Jesus was the culmination of of God's promise to Abram. In fact, years later, there was a young man named Stephen, and, and in Acts 7, in the New Testament, we read how he talks about Jesus being the fulfillment of that covenant that God makes to Abram. A covenantal love is made and it continues and even when you don't see it and even when you don't feel it and even when you think like it's gone, it continues on because there's a promise. And over and over again, God makes good on His Word. And as we see throughout this promise that He gives to Abram, as many of us who have made the decision years ago to put our faith and trust in Jesus have seen in our own lives, God is constantly working. Behind the scenes, weaving things together for our good, even when we don't see it, even when we don't feel it. That He is doing it for our benefit, for our good, and to accomplish His purpose in the world. David says, only goodness and love will follow me all the days of my life. Only goodness and chesed. Only goodness and deep, abiding, abiding covenantal love will follow me all the days of my life. Wow, that's pretty amazing. But then you come to this word follow. Follow is the Hebrew word radaf, which means to pursue or to chase. It's most often used in Scripture to talk about or in the context of an enemy chasing or pursuing or radaf, to radaf their enemy. And so we're just coming out of looking at this verse in the the last week where it talks about God as our generous host who invites us into his tent. And, And we talked about how when you are invited into the shepherd's tent, you not only have their provision, but you have their protection that he will provide for us, and that no matter what enemy is coming, he will give his own life before he will allow that enemy to touch or to hurt us. That when we are living and we are invited into God's tent, that he prepares a table before us, no matter what the enemies are that are around us. And so when David uses the word radaf, he's taking a word that is most often used to talk about our enemies desperately chasing us, for pursuing us, following us, but instead of saying that it is the Ra, the evil, the enemy that is radafing us, that is chasing us, pursuing us, he says this, he says, only goodness and deep abiding covenantal love will chase me all the days of my life. That God's tov and that his kesed is chasing me into the sheepfold at the end of the night, not to scare me, but to remind me that there is something good that is coming behind me. And it could be that what David is talking about is a sheepdog. Right? Even in, in, in Job, well, today in, the, in that part of the country or the world, as was back then, it was very common for shepherds to use dogs. Even in Job, which is the oldest book that was written in the scriptures, it it doesn't describe events that were the oldest, but it was the, the earliest manuscript. And in Job, Job writes, But now they mock me, men younger than me, men younger than I, whose fathers I would have disdained to put with my sheepdogs. So sheepdogs were used for a long, long time. The prophet Isaiah would write, Israel's watchmen are blind, they 
All lack knowledge. They are all muted do mute dogs. They cannot bark. They lie around and dream. They love to sleep. And he's saying that watchmen are like mute dogs. The watchmen at that time. The dogs are mighty with, have mighty appetites. They never have enough. They are shepherds who lack understanding. They all turn to their own way. They seek their own gain. And so we see that part of what the dogs do is that they chase the sheep. And then at the end of the day, even the sheep understand that the dog is chasing them, but it's not chasing them to hurt them. It's chasing them into the sheepfold, into the tent, into the protection of the Father. And as we go through this story, this is the picture that David is painting for us in this entire psalm, all throughout the psalm. This picture of his good shepherd. This good shepherd who, who watches over us, who leads us to places where we can eat and where we can drink. He leads us and navigates us through the dark valleys, knowing where we need to go in order to not only be safe, but in order to thrive. That this good shepherd invites us into his tent for his protection and his provision. And he paints this picture so that you and I can know without a doubt that even though we can't see it, and even though oftentimes we can't feel it, it doesn't feel like it at all, that it is only God's goodness and deep abiding covenantal love that will chase me all of the days of my life. That God, who is the author of everything that is good and beautiful and wonderful, that it is His goodness not ours. It is His deep abiding covenantal love, not ours, that is chasing us every single day. Listen, I don't want to minimize those feelings of stress and anxiety that we feel. They are real. And I know that. And I know that there are people who, who you may have experienced this, that someone came up to you and said, oh, you just need to pray that away. And let me tell you something. Bless them. I think that they are doing what they believe is the best thing. But I have rarely, rarely, in fact, I can't think of a single person who has been experiencing worry and anxiety and, and depression who simply prayed and miraculously left. I'm not saying that God can't do it. Get, God hasn't done it. He may have done it in your life. Praise God for that. I'm just saying that it's rare. It rarely happens. The reality for most of us is those feelings of anxiety and worry and stress don't go away easily. And here's what we think. Because of the fact that they do, it doesn't go away easily, we think that if we still feel it, if it hasn't just disappeared, then that must mean that God isn't working. That God isn't doing anything. That God isn't listening. That God isn't paying attention. That God doesn't care about what's going on in my life. And like sheep, we know that the predators are there, are there in our lives. We know that there's danger all around us. The sheep know that there could be wolves or lions or bears hiding in the shadows. But David is saying, listen, based on what he has experienced, he knows that it is also available for you and I to experience. Not that the feelings of worry and stress and anxiety and fear simply disappear, but that in spite of those feelings, that we can trust that what is right behind us, what is coming up behind us, what is chasing us, is not there to hurt me, but it is there to protect me from the predators that I can't see. It is the goodness, the tov of God, the deep abiding covenantal love of God that his tov and his chesed are chasing after me. And here's the thing. You know that the more that we believe it, the more that we become aware of it. And the more that we become aware of it, the more confident we become in it. And the more confident we become that God's tov, his, his goodness and his chesed his deep abi abiding covenantal love, the more that we are confident that he is chasing after us, 
the less aware we will be of those negative feelings, the less aware we will be of those feelings of worry and stress and fear. Not that they simply disappear, but that as God's love and His goodness flows into us, it pushes out those feelings of stress and worry and anxiety and fear. And when we experience that, we'll be able to say just like David did, not out of a promise, but out of our own experience, that yes, it's only God's goodness, His tov, and His kesed, His deep abiding covenantal love that will radaf me, that will chase me, that will pursue me all the days of my life. And normally at Christmas in July, I try to do a Christmas sermon. But today, as I was going through this, or, or this week as I was preparing for today, I thought about this. Christmas is the celebration of the arrival of Jesus into this world. And Jesus, he says in John 10, 11, he says, I am the good shepherd. And he says, the good shepherd sacrifices his life for the sheep. And so what a fitting time it is that on this, our Christmas in July celebration, that we get to celebrate Jesus, our Good Shepherd, who invites us into his tent, who promises us his provision and his protection, who invites us to rest as he navigates our life to bring us to these pauses and these places where we can truly rest, and who in the end willingly gave his life for you and for me. It is tov and chesed, his goodness and his love that is chasing after us every single day. I pray that you'd allow it to catch you. Thank you for joining us for this week's message. Grace Point Church is located in South San Francisco, California. For additional content or to find out more information about Grace Point Church, visit us online at wearegracepoint.com.